Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. I imagine that by now, many of you already realize that in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to explore the topic of Henri Corbin and the Mundus Imaginalis, the world of the imaginal. My guest is Tom Cheatham, who is a philosopher, biologist, poet, and a professor. He is the author of many books, including The World Turned Inside Out, Henri Corbin and Islamic Mysticism, Imaginal Love, the Meanings of Imagination in Henri Corbin and James Hillman, Green Man, Earth Angel, The Prophetic Tradition and the Battle for the Soul of the World, and All the World an Icon, Henri Corbin and the Angelic Function of Beings. Tom is located in Bar Harbor, Maine, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Tom. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm very excited to talk about Henri Corbin because uh, I've mentioned him well over a dozen times in previous interviews. And usually when I do that, I show the viewers a copy of your book, All the World's an Icon. <laughs> well, I am delighted to be here and I'm delighted to talk about Henri Corbin and all the associated ideas. That's fantastic. Thank you for having me. I guess a good starting point will be to try to define the, the term that we've used in the title of this interview, the Mundus Imaginalis. How Corbin defines it, at least in a few places. And this can make reference to his interpretation of Ibn Arabi, the great Islamic mystic. Um, so, Corbin puts it this way in several places. Between the world of the pure cherubic intelligences and the world of sensible experience, lies the mundus imaginalis as a median and mediating reality. It, it suggests that uh, there is, is a real angelic world, uh, and then there is the human world of our normal ego activity and sensory experience, and, and this mundus imaginalis is a realm in which the two meet each other. That's almost... Right. <laughs> uh, so, so, I just, as a matter of fact, just this morning, probably an hour and a half ago, um, I got something clarified. I was reading um, Hadi Fakhouri's uh, master's thesis on um, Henri Corbin and Russian religious thought which is a masterpiece, and it's a few years old now. Um, and he quotes a passage in Corbin that I've quoted from and used a million times, and seeing it in the context that Hadi gave it, I read it, and I read it, and I thought, I know this, and then I read it one last time, and Oh, it's right there. So in that passage, which is from a super important piece that Corbin wrote towards the very end of his life called um, Towards a Chart of the Imaginal, he says that he, he, he says what I just said. 
he re restates it, that between the world of the intellect, but he doesn't add the pure cherubic intelligences, he says between the world of the intellect and the sensible world of man, that's where the mundus imaginalis is. And then he says that that he said another way of putting this is that between the world of the deitas absconditas, the hidden, utterly transcendent God, and the world of man, that is to say, the sensible world, that's where the mundus imaginalis is. And that's important because the way you said what I had said was to say that between the world of the angels and between the and the sensible world is the and that's not that's not right because the angels are in the mundus imaginalis and and I mean in some sense these are technical details but they're not um, the, 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 because the question of where and what constitutes the mundus imaginalis is is super important if you're going to understand what he's doing. And so in this passage, in that piece, he clarifies for me that it's the mundus imaginalis is between us and the utterly transcendent God about whom we can know nothing. And so it seems to me that in another passage where he says that it's between the intellect as the world of the pure cherubic intelligences, that's strictly speaking not right. <laughs> At least he seems to contradict that here. And that's super important because if, if, if you read the other piece and, and you think, well, wait, Pure cherubic intelligences, those, those sound a lot like angels, and I thought those were in the mundus imaginalis. So I am very happy now to say that between the utterly transcendent God, about whom we can know nothing, and the sensible world, that's where the world of the imagination lies. And it is a mediating world between the transcendent God and us. That's where the angels are. Well, I have two big questions. First of all, I know many of our viewers will have no idea who Henri Corbin is. He's not a famous name. And, and second of all, we need to distinguish between imagination and imaginal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, the, the first part's easy. Uh, so Henri Corbin, let's see, he was born in 1903 and he died in 1978. Uh, he was a Frenchman and uh, mystically inclined religious and philosophical thinker right from the beginning. Uh, it's also important, and we might have a chance to get to this, that he was a musician. He was a, he was a keyboard player. But he was a musician in a spiritual sense, which, which is important for him because in order to understand these, these nonsensical spiritual worlds in which, to which he invites us, musical metaphors are often extremely important for him. And I also think that they help us understand the kind of analogical thinking that he was involved in. Because he would often say, the best way to understand these imaginal realms is by using musical metaphors. So there's that. And he was a professor at the Sorbonne, and he was known in his lifetime mostly as a scholar of Islamic mysticism. Um, he was a regular speaker at the Aranos conferences in Switzerland, where Jung was a, the, the major figure, uh, for decades. He's, Corbin first spoke there right after the war in 1949. And I think the last time he was there was maybe in 77. It was the year before he died. 
So he was one of the major figures at the Aranos conferences for, for that entire time. Um, important to understand about him in our context is that he wasn't merely a scholar of Islamic mysticism. His project, as he understood it, was the philosophical and theological project of explaining the common mystical themes which unite the religions of the Abrahamic tradition, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And he also adds in Zoroastrianism for various reasons which are extremely interesting and important. Um, and he had an enormous influence as a translator and scholar of ancient texts in the Islamic world, but he was also a, a major influence on James Hillman and Hillman's followers and friends, um, and he was among the major figures that Hillman pointed to as founding figures of Hillman's own archetype of psychology. And finally, one discovers that he was a he was an, an important figure in the world of at least American poetry from about 1966 or so on, um, because Diane de Prima, for instance, told me in an email that, oh, yes, everybody was reading the Bollingen books as they came out. This was the series that included Jung, and, and it was the series that included Joseph Campbell's um, selected essays from the Aranos conferences. And in those volumes, Corpin was published. And for various reasons, his writings were very exciting to a variety of American poets, including um, Charles Olson and Diane de Prima and Robert Duncan uh, and Robert Kelly. And there's a whole slew of people who read Corbin and said, he understands what we think we are doing with our poetry. So that is a very short summary of who he was and what he did. I, I gather that he was also very closely connected with Jung. Yeah, yeah, he was. Um, Jung said, uh, and I, I, I should be able to give you a date on this, but, but Corbin wrote a review of Jung's answer to Job, uh, which was quite long, and it, I should I should remember the title of it because I was just looking at it, um, and when they were talking about these issues, Jung felt and said and wrote that this was the first person he'd ever met that he felt really understood where he was coming from. And that would that would be because they were both Gnostics in some sense. They were both coming to this material, through this material, uh, from places of deep personal experience of the sort that they both liked to celebrate. That is the individuating potential of these experiences. So they both, in different ways, admittedly, but they both believed and experienced the profundity of what generally gets called Gnostic experience. That is, it is a spiritual voice addressed to you and you alone. And that's why both of them were very... Um, particularly Corbin, but were, they were both very hesitant about um, having much enthusiasm for institutional religions. Well, I think that's a very good summary. Uh, and now back to the second part of my original question. I'm pretty sure Carbon makes uh, an important distinction between the imaginal realm, the mundus imaginalis, and 
fantasy or imagination the way we think of it as like Walt Disney uh, kind of terms. That is totally right. And and let's see, I'm going to preface all this by saying this is really confusing. And I'm s- I am still unsure about where I come down on this. And it's a major distinction between Hellman and Corbin, for sure. And we'll just leave Jung out of it. <laughs> we got enough trouble. We got enough confusion with Jung and Hillman. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Corbin and Hillman. Um, and it's crucially important for me in my own life because, as was true for Jung and Hillman and Corbin, I think that this material, if you want to call it that, is only interesting because it points the way to personal transformation. And because I'm a sort of heady kind of person, it matters a lot to me how I'm imagining these ideas. Because if you imagine them in one way, it will turn you towards one kind of path. If you imagine them in a different way, it turns you in a different direction. This, by the way, this idea of reflecting on and about your own ideation as it applies to the world is part of that hermeneutic circle, which is crucial for Corbin and was one of the reasons that the poets got so excited about it, because they thought he knows what we think we are doing with our poetry. We are imagining ourselves into a world we are creating as we move into it. And that is precisely what Corbin was up to. However, and here comes the here comes the difficulty. For Corbin, as a young man, he was happy to say, for example, heretics of the world unite. <laughs> As it turns out, he was very aware of this. I just was reading in Hadi's dissertation. He was very aware of this. He said, yeah, I, I am attracted to the heretical fringes of Islam and Christianity and Judaism because, because that's where the really interesting stuff happens. And as a young man, he was happy to, to travel in these... Uh, uh, institutionally uh, suspect terrains. As an old man, his friend Denise de Rougemont said to him, oh, do you remember when you said heretics of the world unite? And Corbin said, no, 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 I never would have said that. I, I must have said esotericists of the world unite. And I believe that you can see in some of his later writings, perhaps spurred, I think, um, by Hillman's use of the term mundus imaginalis, Corbin is very careful to say, no, no, wait a minute. What I mean by mundus imaginalis is quite special special, and you can't forget that. And he would be happy to to refer to Paracelsus, as Jung often did, who distinguished between true imagination, vera imaginatio, and mere fantasy. And Corbin comes down quite hard on that. They see, as a young man, you don't worry so much if so-and-so is a heretic. Let's follow him where he goes. As an old man, you recognize, ooh, 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 some of those heretics. Mm, Got to watch them. They go to crazy places. And I think he very much saw Hillman's use of the term mundus imaginalis as outside the bounds of propriety. There may, 
I, I, I'm confident that that's true. Exactly what spurred his disease, I don't know. But as an old man, he said, look, this special realm of true imagining, of the mundus imaginalis, is quite fragile. If you take it out of its context, the context where it's defined in Iranian mysticism, <laughs> he actually says that, but of course, that's what he himself did, was to expand it into other contexts. He says, if you're not careful with this, you will lose that distinction between true imagining and mere fantasy. For Corbin, there's a definite distinction. And for Corbin personally, it, 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 it would have to do with the fact that true imagining is, as he puts it, hieratic and serious and spiritual. And true imagining comes from above. It is derived from the light of the angel Gabriel, depending on which tradition you're in, but the light of the angels. It's the descent of heavenly forms into the human receptacle. So there's a ontological, theological reason that you have to keep that separate from stuff that just sort of bubbles up from below, you know, which is just human stuff. Two points to be made. First is, well, how do you know the difference? What's the method? You know, if you're going to set up this distinction between the real stuff and the fake stuff, <laughs> then how do you tell? Well, if you're a Gnostic, you, well, let, 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 I don't want to say it that way. I'll say, Corbin never tells you. <laughs> <laughs> He, he never says, oh, you'll know because it's red, or you'll know because it feels, you know, he just doesn't do that. And, and I think the rationale for that has to be, oh, well, you'll know it when you see it. And, and this would, I think, correspond to Jung's distinction between big dreams and little dreams. Okay. And, and, I mean, I think most of us who are interested in these things will recognize, oh, man, whoa, that was a big dream. I'm going to take that, you know, but the night before it was pizza. I don't know what that was about, you know. And, and, and so, but there's, but methodologically for Corbin, he can't be in a position to tell you how to know which imaginings are true because then he'd set up a church and he'd have a little book that would say these this is how you know but he can't do that because he's a gnostic i can give a nice example of a place of a, of, a, of, a, of a transition that i often use not to answer this question but to show how and where it occurs so Corbin is very fond of quoting Schleiermacher, who said in the late 1800s, I, I think, that any book written with the same power as the Bible should be understood to be a Bible. This is during the time when Max Mueller and all those folks were bringing the sacred books of other cultures into the Western world in translation. And, and you said that would be a cool thing to say. You know, very ecumenical, very culturally sensitive. Say, if you want to take the Quran as a Bible, I got no problem with that. And I think surely Corbin had that in mind. The Quran, you know, or the Bhagavad Gita or whatever. You know, sure, of course. If, 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 yes, that's what characterizes something as a Bible. Well, one of the American poets who was just stunned by Corbin's writings was Charles Olson. Oh, well, well, as a step before Olson, 
what about William Blake? What about Blake's Jerusalem? Or the marriage of heaven and hell? Is that got enough power to be like a Bible? You know, you think Corbin would probably say, eh, I don't know, maybe Goethe, but not not Blake. You know, so you know, and then and then Charles Olson's Maximus poems. I mean, it's you know, London is Jerusalem is one thing, but Gloucester. I mean, come on. I mean, and and, and what what so the young Corbin, who knows how far he might have gone. But these poets like Robert Kelly and George Quasha and Diane de Prima and, and a slew of others, they are understanding their poetry as a form of what Corbin calls a visionary recital. And they're taking it spiritually, as transformative as, as, as the Bible has been for centuries in the Western tradition. And Corbin doesn't tell you where you can, where you draw the line. Is it, is it between the Bible and William Blake or William Blake? And I mean, you know, does Jack Kerouac count? I mean, you know, how do you do this? And as a Gnostic, he can't give you any, any, any guidance except but, to say you'll know it when you see it. Isn't it the case, though, that Corban uh, provides an example in terms of his own relationship with Suravardi, the Islamic mystic who, as a matter of fact, was executed as a heretic. That's right, yeah. And, and just as a footnote here, Massignon's hero, Al-Halaj, was also executed as a heretic. And Massignon was a teacher of, of Corbin, so they're both in, this, in the same, not quite the same generation, but they're both uh, Western Christians with a passion for Islamic thought. And, yeah, and yes, both of them fell in love, and that's not the right. That's not a terrible word. They they both were utterly transformed by these mystical writers in the Islamic tradition. And yes, so here's the. This is supposed to give us the best guidance to answering this question. Which let's clarify again. What we're trying to get a handle on in our own lives is, if Corbin were here today, how, what would he tell me about my own imagination and my own process and my own um, interaction in the world? And, and how do I distinguish between the fluff and nonsense and the, the real things, the, the, the hem of the angel? You know, because unless you're super lucky and you, you know, get hit with a hammer by, by Gabriel himself, you're going to spend a lot of time looking around and sniffing and saying, gosh, that dream or that vision or that, or this poet maybe, or, and, and, you know, at, at our level, <laughs> at least at my level, it's really hard to know which way to go. And what would he tell us? Well, I think in practice, he's not much help, but he does give indications. I, th I think, you know, Jung and even Hellman are more help. <laughs> I mean, one of this is sort of a, a, an aside here, but, but Corbin is a real mystic and a real scholar, and he's not a therapist, and he's not a spiritual teacher, and he doesn't have people sitting at his robes, at his feet, and, and asking for help. And so he doesn't, he, he doesn't talk to us as if he, we were his disciples. He never does that. But what he does do, uh, at least in several places, but I'm thinking of his book on Ibn Arabi, he says, you know, every once in a while, there's a very strong spiritual individual who can kind of break out of the pack of those who are in the institution of the religion and Seek their own path, but you gotta, you gotta have some capacity for it. And Ibn Arabi, he says, was one of those. And I, I'm gonna say this, <laughs> and I'm not sure how much I believe it, but I think Corbin thought he was one of those too, that at least had some, he at least had enough of a connection with 
Shorvardi to feel that Shorvardi, this guy had been dead for hundreds of years, was his own spiritual master. And so he is he feels himself, I think, a member of a of a lineage that has guide that has guided him. In Ibn Arabi's case, you just get nailed by the angel with no intermediary. I mean that's that's not that's not right because Ibn Arabi had human teachers, but I, I think the story as Corban tells it is that from a very early age, uh, Ibn Arabi pretty much didn't need any human teachers because he was in contact with the, the 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 real stuff pretty directly. But as Corban says, and we all know, that's pretty rare. Which is why you have churches and why you have Sufi, you know, enclaves, and you and you need most people need a human teacher, and and Corban, I think, in his heart of hearts, is kind of skeptical of that, you know, because human teachers, eh, you know, all sorts of bad things can happen with human teachers. They're so human, <laughs> and so in in the ideal world. And and here's where here's where Corban and Jung kind of come together. They both Corban and Jung think that something like individuation occurs, can occur, and it requires, in Corban's case, that you have a meeting with your heavenly twin, with your angel, and once that's happened, you can kind of taste it, and that's one of the. That's that's one of the smell and taste or, 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 or metaphors that you see in, in Arabic a lot. It's a very physical sort of um, mysticism. Um, and of course, Jung has the same idea underlying his psychology, that there is something like the self, which corresponds, broadly speaking, to, to Corban's angel. And if you can connect with that, I, I think they both sort of say, You'll know it when it happens, though Jung gives you a whole bunch of tools. And Corban kind of just says, run from the dark, move towards the light, and seek your heavenly twin. And that's useful, well, but not that much help. Suravardi, as, as I understand it, and I know very little actually about uh, his, his writings or, or those of uh, Ibn Arabi, uh, but I g gather at least in the case of Suravardi, he's associated with a school of thought known as, I think, Illuminism. Would, would that, the idea of Illuminism, uh, be consistent with uh, Mundus Imaginalis? Oh, absolutely right. So, <laughs> Corbin, right from the beginning, he's all about light. Um, I mean, so uh, right from the beginning. So, one of the one of the interesting things about Corbin and and his relationship with Shurvardi is that they're both really interested in the early religion of Persia, which is Zoroastrianism. And to this day, there are Zoroastrians around, and they have temples of light. There's a, there's a perpetual flame burning in a Zoroastrian temple. And Zoroastrianism, at least through Corban, and I, has, I want to be sure Listeners know, like you, what I know about Shurvardi and Ibn Arabi and Zoroastrianism all comes from Corban. I am not the scholar that he was. My knowledge, such as it is, is all from Corban. So Corban's interpretation of Zoroastrianism relies relies heavily on the distinction between the the. The, the powers of light and the powers of darkness. There's Ormaz, who's the god on high, and there's Araman, who's the who's the demonic twin, corresponds to the devil. Um, uh, 
in, in many, many ways. And in the Zoroastrian universe, as, as, as transmitted by Corbin, we live in the world of mixture, which is why it's so confusing about what to do, you know? <laughs> now, how do you, how do you, how do you be a better person rather than a worse person? Well, you avoid the darkness and you go toward the light, which is in a world of mixture, often kind of ambiguous. But the idea is, and, and this is actually, I think, beautiful. <laughs> in Corbin's telling, there's nothing wrong with matter. <laughs> That for the Zoroastrians, the material world, before Araman got his hands on it, is suffused with its own divine light. Matter in itself, it's a long way from the subtle body of the, you know, the divine, but in itself, it's luminous, it's magnificent. It's a great place to live. And then Araman gets his hands on it and it becomes darkened. And our job, along with our helper angels, um, is to get rid of the Aramanian darkness and perceive the light which surrounds us, which involves it's a cosmological uh, project, but be, but by changing what Corbin would call your mode of being, you can begin to see through the darkness and you can see the beauty behind things. And that's a job you can do to yourself. <sighs> this, you know, so... <clears throat> We're, we're way outside a cosmology of dualism. There, there's no way, I, anybody who wants to understand where Corban is standing to say all these things, in, in order to understand him, you have to give up the dualism between matter and spirit. Because otherwise you'll never understand what he means by the mundus imaginalis as a mediating place. And so, in very good Platonic and Neoplatonic fashion, everything that's good <laughs> and light and divine about the created world, which is wonderful because it was created by the good God, Everything that's light and wonderful draws you back towards paradise. Yeah, all right, that'll do. <laughs> so, so for Corbin, any real knowledge descends into us, and the and and the metaphors that help us to grasp this heavenly origin of knowledge include the metaphor of light and the metaphor of music. And so there is no sense in Shurovardi or in Corbin. There, there are no British empiricists in this world. <laughs> they, they got it completely wrong. Um, you you do not start with material sensations and abstract general ideas from them. That's entirely backwards. Here's an anecdote that mm, so it might help. <laughs> so far as I can remember it, I should have the quote. So apparently... Something like this is true. I believe that there's, and, and forgive me, any Islamic uh, scholars or or Muslims in the audience, forgive me for getting this wrong, but I'll get the I'll get the general general gist of it. I, I think that on one of Muhammad's uh, 
uh, mystical visions, he was given a cup of milk to drink, and he drank it. Well, there was a there was a, uh, a, a, a an Islamic thinker who had a dream about a cup of milk, and he thought, "Oh, I wonder if that's if that's a real if that was real milk." When he woke up in the morning, and so he made himself vomit, and whoops, there was milk there. So he thought, "Aha! It was real milk that I got in my dream." And Ibn Arabi's comment is. No, 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 no. That's not how you do hermeneutics. That is not the point. You don't go from the dream down into the material world. You go the other way, you knucklehead. I mean, it doesn't matter whether there was milk in your belly. It has nothing to do with it, which is, <laughs> which is very much, I think, Ibn Arabi's approach to things like the paranormal. You know, it doesn't really matter about what you can push around with your mind down here. That's that's beside the point. The, the point is you go up. <laughs> and and Corbin is just soaking in that kind of transcendent dynamic. So so that explains a little bit. That's a little bit of a way to address your question about the, the importance of light as a metaphor in Corbin. Well, it's beautifully put, Tom, and inspiring as as well. But now, since you brought up Ariman and Ariman's messing with this material world and somehow transforming the material world in, into a dark place, how does Corban deal with that? The you might say the dark side of the super sensible realm. He's no help at all. <laughs> uh, I mean, I should I should talk with Hadi and and Charles Stang and Todd Lawson to see if I can get some clarification on this from them, but I doubt that they'll give me much um, because he doesn't give you any. Here's one, actually. You know, actually, I can give you a fantastic example. I'll, I'll contradict myself because that's how I always answer the question. I always say he doesn't give you any any methodology, any programmatic help. And how do you run from darkness and go towards light? You know, he just says, "Yeah, you know, find your angel, you'll be okay." Uh, actually, that's not true. I had. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I've shared personal stories about Corbin many times with my students, and I don't mind doing it here. Uh, what's the most compact way of talking about this? Th there's a there's a, a chapter in his book on Ibn Arabi, which involves um, a, a story that Ibn Arabi tells about being in doubt. Well, if you know anything about Ibn Arabi, he's sort of a greater than human figure. And if Ibn Arabi's having doubts, they're probably pretty passionate, you know, like big doubts. <laughs> but Ibn Arabi says he was he was doubting where whether the angelic figures were were okay. I mean, I'm I am paraphrasing very, very widely. And and he says, gosh, you know, I'm I wonder if are they still there? Are they okay? And the figure of Nizam, who's an actual human being, um, with whom he has a, correct, a connection such that he sees her as a figure of Sophia, divine wisdom, she appears to him and says, <laughs> essentially, wait, wait a minute, <laughs> wait, wait a minute, man, you're worried if they're okay? <laughs> You're the one with the problem, man. They're fine. I mean, they're divine figures for heaven's sakes. They're fine. It's your problem. Okay. So the reason I use that as an exemplary story is that for many years, I for some number of years, I suffered from a really deep depression of a sort that um, I would wish on no one, and of the sort that you don't medicate yourself for, because it's not that. 
And towards the end <laughs> of that depression, I was meditating on that chapter in which Corbin focuses on, on that event. And I wrote an essay, which shows up in one of the books called The Test of the Veil. And oh, there's a, at the time I was seriously flirting with the possibility of becoming a Christian, whatever that meant for me. As it turns out, I don't have it in me, or not yet anyway, but I was reading in the Eastern Orthodox tradition and there's a wonderful, there's a wonderful comment by Olivier Clément in his magnificent book, The Roots of Christian Mysticism, where he talks about he calls it something different, but he talks about the test of the veil. He says, he's talking about the early monastic tradition, the desert fathers and mothers who were, who were pretty intense individuals, you know, and they often went through moments of spiritual tribulation, which I felt clearly was where I was at. And there's some passages in there about Isaac the Syrian, and in one of those passages, I don't have it right here, but I, I, I marked Isaac knows this guy, this, this guy in the desert, he's in the same place that I am. And that's, that's, I thought, oh shit, that is fan That is so great to know that somebody else has been in this incredibly dark place. Olivier Clément says, well, you know, there's a reason for that. So imagine, <laughs> and again, I'm paraphrasing. Imagine God were just there for you all the time. You know, you'd sort of start taking it for granted. Say, oh yeah, God's there. But God doesn't like that. God would like you to remember, you know, that he's a big deal. And so he veils himself and he goes away for a little while. And then you descend into the depths of spiritual anxiety and catastrophe. And then he pops up again and you say, oh, thank God you're back. <laughs> and it's this back... <laughs> And fourth, that gives you, Clément says, a lively feeling for the reality of God. And I thought, okay, okay, all right, that's, that's kind of funny, actually. And I thought, well, that's what's going on with Ibn Rabi here. And what is the source of this deep pessimism, nihilism, if you read it the way I read it at the time, it was my own personal hermeneutic, Nizam Sophia is saying to Ibn Arabi, you knucklehead, how inflated do you have to be to think that they're not okay? I mean, who on earth do you think you are? I worked through those passages for, I don't know, a long time, weeks. And I, and, and that was the hermeneutic the, for me, I think, the way, the way the, the, the medieval Christian monks used to read the Bible. They would read it as if it were written for them. And I was reading Corbin's account of Ibn Arabi's moments of doubt in the same way. And I very slowly wrote and hermeneuted, <laughs> in, I interpreted my way out of that spiritual catastrophe and and it's the I don't really quite remember but when when it lifted I thought I got it that's never coming back and if it, which it hasn't and that was 10 or 15 years ago and if it does I'll, I'll know how to handle it so so in that sense Corban, by presenting these stories of Ibn Arabi and Shirardi and, and the others, as I, I suppose we could call that a visionary recital, though I had never thought of it before in exactly those terms. I mean, that's a that's a big idea from Corban, the notion of a visionary recital, which he often, in my reading, presents as less dark than that. But no, I mean, that was my own visionary recital drawn from Corbin's work. So in that sense, that's the kind of help. And now I've, now I've talked myself completely around 180 degrees. In that sense, if you're the right person, Corbin can change your life.
but he never gives you a an institute of Corbin studies <laughs> or a or a manual of dream analysis. He provides stories and examples and a cosmology to those who are able to use it that can transform your life. That's a great realization for me, man. That is that is that is better than I thought it was. <laughs> Let me feed back to you, if I may, what I think I'm deriving from this discussion, since it's it started out with a talk of Ariman and the, the demonic, and it seems as if the underlying principle here is is that the angelic beings that emerge or are precipitated, one might say, from the divine realm and are totally okay, totally pure, totally good, uh, are very, very different from the, the demonic. Uh, and, and the sense I'm getting is that the demonic is actually a projection of the human mind, not the divine. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's lots of ways to approach this, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to give, I'm trying to default to the easy option <laughs> relatively, which is what did Corbin think about this? Um, yeah, um, that would be true with with one interesting um, uh, caveat. Let me see if I can fill that in. Uh, the the there are many levels of. You know what pseudo Dionysius there Alpagide called um you know divine divine hierarchies yes. in in the, there's the, these these cosmologies of Avicenna and Ibn Arabi and all, they're very hierarchical, which I have a postmodern problem with, which I think can be easily solved, <laughs> but they are hierarchical um and one of the interesting things is that. I forget where the, 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 where where he gets it, but at each level in the in the hierarchy of creation, every being has a light face facing towards the divine and a dark face taste, facing downward. So so it is not the case that every angel is a perfect being of light, because every angel, you know, you get up to level six. And you're up there and you think, well, that guy, he's an asshole. That's, you're looking at his dark face. <laughs> okay. So, so there's a certain level of darkness. I mean, <laughs> at every level, it gets, gets smaller and smaller and the light gets bigger and bigger, but it's a more complex cosmology because these were extraordinarily sophisticated thinkers. They, they inhabited a world of ideas, which is radically different from our own, but they were pretty well aware of the fact that, you know, creation is complicated, and it's complicated enough down here, and probably it's even more complicated up there, so I'm just telling you the best I got, you know, so I, I don't think, I think it's super easy to do a cartoon version of medieval uh, theology, and to miss the fact that these folks who, who, wrote down these theological ideas. They were just as smart as we were. You know, they had their Hegels and their and their, you know, Kant's and their Heidegger's. I mean, these are smart folks. And they're not just saying, oh, you go up and it's all light. They knew it doesn't work that way. At least at least that's my non scholarly um imagination of how they ought to be understood. The question of, of evil, you know, right up until the end of his life, Corban is still drawing on the Zoroastrians. Um, he was, the, the, one, one question to be addressed is, well, was he a Muslim? No, he never converted. Um, was he a Christian? Well, yeah, yeah. Um, was he a Jew? No, 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 definitely not that. So not Muslim and, and not Jewish and, and, and not, well, kind of not Zoroastrian, though right up until the last things he wrote, he's talking about Ormazd and Araman and the Fravartis. And so there's a pretty strong dualistic uh, theme in in Corpan's work, um, which includes the fact that 
it's you know it's been a while since I've read these texts, but and then so I really ought to go check. But his God is not the omnipotent deity of standard Christianity. Corbin's God needs us. Corbin's God needs the Fravartis, those who have chosen to fight in the battle against the darkness of Aramon. We are engaged in this. I think right up until the end of his life, he had that Zoroastrian um, uh, sense to him. And, and if, if you read the right kind of Christian theology, you can find it in Christianity, I'm sure, because that's a huge, that's a huge religion. Um, but for Corbin, no, there is the, this business about evil being the privation of good. Nah, -uh. you're not going to see that in Corbin. No, Armand is a bad guy <laughs> and needs to be battled. Um, here's here's something that's that's pertinent to this: the question of, well, how do you know where he is <laughs> and all his minions? I mean, <laughs> quick aside, one standard criticism of Corbin from a lot of quarters is that his religion is so non-legalistic and so Gnostic that, well, what about the Ten Commandments, man? I mean, what about some rules here so we know what to do? And Corbin doesn't talk that way, but he knows full well that there are the Ten Commandments and that there's all this, you know, he knows that you need some rules. It's just that's not the part of the religion that he's excited about. He's more excited about um, Kidder, the green man who comes to Moses and says, hey, you, you know all those commandments? Well, here's what they really mean. <laughs> Corbin loves that kind of movement. Nonetheless, he here's another here's another place where he gives an inkling of how we ought to behave, <laughs> but you'll see it's, it's of limited utility. Um, he talks about Nietzsche, you know, and Nietzsche's doubt. I mean, Ibn Rabi is merely wondering whether the divine figures are still there. Uh, Nietzsche says God is dead. <laughs> and, and Corbin's response is, man, here's this really smart guy, really smart, sensitive guy, and he's got a failed initiation. That's what Corbin calls it. That, that, that Nietzsche got to right to the threshold, <laughs> at which point Corbin says, well, there's two kinds of darkness. There's the darkness of Armon, of undisputed evil, and then there's the darkness at the approach to the pole. <laughs> that is to say, the light there is so bright that you go blind. And you see nothing but black. He calls it the black light, and he gets it from Najmodin Kubra, one of the Central Asian Sufi mystics who he was excited about. And he said, that's what happened to Nietzsche. I'll go ahead and say this. He says, that's what happened to Nietzsche. You know, he got blinded. He was so close, and he had a failed initiation, and he thought, ah, oh, what I'm seeing is the truth, which is nihilism. I mean, this is a Corbinian interpretation of Nietzsche, and plenty of people see other Nietzsches. But the Nietzsche who said, God is dead and we have killed him, and the truth of things is nihilism, Corbin says, no, he got those blacknesses backwards, man. He misunderstood what was going on, and you have to be able to distinguish different kinds of darkness. Now, in, a, in the 21st century, if you've been reading along in your philosophical works for the last hundred years, if there's two kinds of darkness, there's probably a lot. <laughs> and, and that would go back to the Zoroastrian problem of the world of mixture. Uh, and, oh, geez, this is a kind of a dark gray. <laughs> there's so many shades of gray. <laughs> you know, so he's not much help. Well, earlier you pointed out that Corban was not a dualist in the sense of the dualism between matter and spirit, but it does sound like he's a dualist uh, in the dualism of good and evil. 
I, I believe that to be true, though I would be happy to be corrected by, by others. I, I think that is true. Um, that being said, I, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think about his, his, um, uh, his his understanding of uh, what do they call it in theology apocatastasis whether at, at the final cataclysm even the devils get forgiven and everything returns to paradise i'm not sure he I'm not sure he says much about that but what but but what he there's a there's a story there's a myth that he talks about that i that i love that's somehow pertinent here that may point to a direction in which he personally would have would have gone. He talks about a, a couple of Zoroastrian cosmogonies. <laughs> he loves those words. A couple of Zoroastrian stories about the origin of things that account for the appearance of Ahriman. And in the one that always comes to mind, because it's fun to parody, um, Ahriman's up there and he's great and complete and perfect and hasn't created anything yet. And not Arman, uh, uh, Ormaz, the, the great creator god is up there being perfect and being complete. And he suddenly has a doubt and he thinks, whoa, wait a minute. What if I'm not perfect? <laughs> There's this, this little, little moment of self-doubt that gives birth to everything. Whoosh, all the way down. All the way down the bottom is the darkness of Ahriman, and all the way up here is him being sort of perfect, but not exactly. You know, you do you feel that? <laughs> Can you, that is such that is such a cool story. It's that moment of doubt that we then see again in Ibn Arabi. Without that moment of doubt, you're just sort of a happy-go-lucky knucklehead. You know, it's the moment of doubt that causes everything interesting in creation and everything interesting in human life. It's that little bit of chiroscuro that without which we'd all be so perfect and so happy, we would just blink out of existence. And that's the sort of that's the sort of richness that 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 Corbin brings to his experience of the world. He also tells Oh God! Somewhere there's a really cool story about um, uh, I don't know, like Tabata Bai, who he spoke with, was one of the Shiite clerics um, who was talking about a Shiite interpretation of the myth of the fall from from the Garden of Eden, and in Islam, as I learn it from Henri Corbin, there's no doctrine of original sin. Um, you know, we're not, we're not stuck with Adam and Eve's horrible sin that we then have to be forgiven for. Tabata Bai says to him, well, you know, it wasn't, it was a fall, but if it hadn't happened, this extraordinarily glorious creation, which we, we, that we experience would never have come into being. You have to have a fall from the perfection of the creator. This is very similar. What, what do you call it in, um, uh, in Christian theology? It's the, um, oh, I can't, there's a nice Latin phrase, um, for the, the happy mistake, the, the happy sin, you know, mm. I think that comes from Augustine. Um, and, and there's a, there's a creation myth in Ibn Arabi, in, in the book on Ibn Arabi, which, which is also really cool. So there's God. This time it's not Ormazd, it's Allah. And he's sitting up there in his perfection and he's lonely. <laughs> and, and there's, cause there's nobody to praise him. <laughs> it's like, man, this is a drag. This for all eternity. And so he's very sad. And in his sigh of sadness, he breathes everything that is into creation all the way down all those levels of being. And then, of course, down at the bottom, they're looking back up and they're nostalgic. 
they thought, oh man, what are we doing down here? And that energy of divine nostalgia is what provides the energy for the eternal return. So in this mythology, as Corbin tells it, every being is simultaneously ascending and descending at every moment. Is that cool or what? <laughs> I, I really love that, Tom. That, <laughs> that was beautiful. And I do think uh, that our viewers now have a sense of Corban and the Mundus Imaginalis uh, and of Tom Cheatham. <laughs> yeah, for better words. <laughs> for better, definitely for better. I, I, I'm thrilled that we've done this interview, and I you know, hope that we do many more. I'd like to have uh, a discussion with you about the Green Man. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, anytime, anytime. I'd be delighted to come. Well, we'll we will do that. But for now, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, Tom, for for sharing your soul with the New Thinking Aloud audience. It's it's been fabulous. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you because you are the reason that we are here. <music> We've just released issue number two of the New Thinking Aloud quarterly magazine. You can download a free copy at the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website, newthinkingaloud.org.